really asking the question, what are the habits of a disciple of Jesus? I don't, don't, don't let me just become a, a fan of Jesus, right? But let me become a disciple of Jesus. And how do I cultivate those seemingly little things that all together end up making me more like Jesus? And so today I'm going to finish up that series. I think it's really going to be uh, impactful in your life. And then next week we are having what we're calling Vision Sunday. Vision Sunday is an opportunity for, if you've been around for a while, for you to go, hey, here's where we are and here's where we're going. If you're new, Vision Sunday is an opportunity in this new relationship we're forming to kind of look under the hood a little bit and see what our heartbeat is, right? To see what we're passionate about, to see what really matters to us. I think it's important as a church family to know, like, what are our values and and what are they driving us to do and so that's next week so don't miss vision sunday and we've got uh something exciting happening after that as well if you uh didn't know in your worship guide there are fill in the blank notes i love it right here on the front row we got the notes out they're ready they even got the notes binder if you didn't know there are binders you can collect all of these notes listen i'm gonna preach even better just because i saw that right there all right uh, but take some notes. I believe God wants to deposit something into your heart and into your mind today. So let me ask you a question. Do you know why Death Valley is called Death Valley? Why is Death Valley called Death Valley? Here's a, here's a photo of Death Valley 2004. You can look at it, and, and there's an aspect of it that's a little beautiful, honestly, because it's so unique. Right? Where else in the world can you go that there literally is no life, thus the name Death Valley? Right? Where else can you go and you literally can look for miles and miles and miles and miles and there's just nothing growing at all? Which begs the question, why? Why is Death Valley dead? Why when I go outside in Kentucky, I can see hills upon hills upon hills of the bluegrass, this beautiful grass growing all over every hill, every valley, but yet you go to Death Valley and there's nothing. It's dead, seemingly, except for this interesting phenomenon happened in 2004, 2005 in Death Valley. The end of 2004, there this, came this rain, and over just a few days, seven inches of rain just dumped into Death Valley. And then in the spring of 2005, that desert turned into a valley of flowers. It was, it was just a marvelous phenomenon. People were just like, I don't even know how to comprehend what has happened to Death Valley. Which let us know that it wasn't that the valley was dead. It's just that it was dormant. That underneath the soil the whole time there were seeds. there, There was the potential for life in Death Valley every single year. There was just one missing ingredient that made it all begin to sprout, that made it all begin to grow, that that changed the entire atmosphere of that situation, of that place. It reminds me, years ago, I had the privilege of going to to Israel, and on one of the tours, they were telling us about this archaeological dig that happened, and they found in this jar these seeds for the date palm tree. Now, this dig had had been dated. All the things they were finding here were from the time of Jesus. And so they they were kind of excited, right? We found these seeds of these trees from the time of of Jesus. And they asked themselves this question. Like, they've been preserved in this jar, airtight, protected from moisture. I wonder what would happen if we planted these. And they planted those seeds... And today, there are date palm trees growing, producing fruit from seeds that sat dead for 2,000 years. Those, Those two stories tell me something, and they should tell you something. That 
in our life, there can be things that feel dead, that can feel dry, that can feel lifeless. But maybe just like Death Valley, they're just dormant. Maybe just like that seed, they just haven't been exposed to the right element that makes the life come to life. I believe the same is true in our hearts, in our lives, in, in every aspect of our being. That Maybe even when it comes to our, our spiritual life and our connection with God, maybe you can feel like it's dormant. Maybe you feel like, man, I'm just waiting for something new to happen. I'm waiting for some growth. I'm, I'm waiting for things to flourish and for there to, to be a, a, a brighter day. Right? So, so what is that, what is that rain... What is that water for our souls? Well, if you look in the book of Psalms, a couple different scriptures help me realize what that rain is for our soul. In Psalm 1611, it says this. It says, you make known to me the path of life. You make known to me the path of life, this prayer, this song to the Lord. It says, you will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. I mean, think about this. The psalmist is writing this worship song to God and says, it's you. It's you. It's when I get close to you that I have life. It's when, it's when I recognize your presence in my life that I have joy. It, it's you. Like, it, it has always been you. And, I, and I, he's going, I want to write this song just to declare to you that it's, it's you. I just, I need more of you in my life because you are the ingredient that turns dormant things into abundant, flourishing things. Well, then begs the question is, if, if our proximity to God changes everything, how do, we, how do we get closer to God? Well, another psalm, Psalm 145 in verse 18 says this. It says, the Lord is near to those who call on him. To those who call on him. This tells me one really powerful truth. That prayer is the path to God's presence. Prayer is the path to God's presence, and God's presence is this thing in my life and in your life that changes everything. Everything. If, if there's a part of my life that's lacking, if I can just make sure God is present in that part, there's hope. There's hope. There's hope for that marriage. There's hope for that relationship. There's hope for my finances. There's, there's hope for my future. There's hope in this area. If I know God is in that place, I know that there is a reason to hope for new life. And prayer is that path to God's presence. Prayer is that thing that draws us close to God. And helps us be more aware of him in our life. So this is, this is good news. But this is also bad news, right? It's good news because we, we got the answer. Right? It's, it's good news because we're like, yes, okay. Prayer brings me closer to God. God changes everything. Easy formula. One plus one equals two. Right? But what happens when prayer is a place of your greatest insecurities? Right? What happens when prayer is something that you felt like you've been told your whole life you should pray, but you've never really been told how to pray? Right? What if, what if you find yourself every time you go to pray, you find yourself very distracted? These are things that, that, that I've struggled with through the years. It's like, you should pray, you should pray, you should pray. Right? I remember as a teenager, staying up late at night because I'm a night owl. Right? Any night owls in the house, raise your hand. Anybody, you like, just, y'all go to bed, let me do my thing, right? That works until you're married. But I remember at late at night, I would get my Bible out, and, 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 and I would just be trying to pray. But 
I don't know, any, another, another little survey. Any ADHD people in the house? Come on, be it proud. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Listen. And you, you're like reading, but then your brain's about bouncing all over here. And you're like, okay, Lord, I'm going to pray. But then your brain's bouncing all over here. And, and so it becomes this thing where it's like, okay, I've got the answer, but I just feel like I've got so many hurdles standing in the way of me feeling like prayer is something that I can be good at. I think this is a pretty common situation. We know we should pray, but then because we know we should and we feel uh, ill-equipped for it, we kind of just go the other way. Because nobody likes to do things they're not good at. Right? It's the reason why like, I played baseball when I was a little kid, because any boy in Georgia, you just play baseball as soon as you can stand. But then as I got older, I realized striking out's not fun. You know what? I'm, I'm better with my feet. Let me go play soccer. I'm pretty good at that. Let me, let me do something I'm good at, right? But here's what I want to challenge you with. If prayer is the path to God's presence, and it is, and if God's presence is that one thing that changes everything, then prayer should be a skill that I am passionate about developing in my life. I need to overcome the hurdles. I need to face the insecurities. I need, to, I need to, instead of just going, I, I, I'm going to have enough willpower to do it, I'm going to have enough humility to learn how to do it. Right? Because prayer changes things. It changes everything. So I, I want to lean in, in some very practical ways today, into this habit of prayer. This aspect of a walk of a disciple of Jesus so that hopefully you will feel like, man, I, I, can, I can start to take some steps here, right? I can start to, to move forward in this area of my life. And so I want you to write this down. The first thing is this. You've got to make prayer a priority. You've got to make prayer a priority. And I'm not saying make prayer a priority because I want to heap shame on you because you... you you just aren't praying as much as you want to. But here's what I know about prayer. Is that when it becomes my only option, I overcome all the hurdles that stand in the way. I mean, think about it. All the things that keep you and I from just naturally stepping into prayer, just easily stepping in and just, man, I got great, just, you know, this is an easy thing. All those things quickly disappear when crisis shows up. Right? When you're like, oh, I got the bill coming and I don't know if I'm going to pay that bill. All of a sudden, all the things that kept you from praying, boop, you get the back seat. I need to get to Jesus because he needs to help me with that situation. When you get a, a diagnosis from the doctor and you're like, I, I don't like what the doctor's saying, all of a sudden all those things, those hurdles that were standing in the way of you praying get moved to the back seat and prayer becomes a priority. So my, my thought is this. Is prayer only a priority in my life if I'm responding to crisis instead of just responding to Christ? There's this, it's this aspect of knowing God and knowing who He is and knowing His love and affection for me and knowing His desire to be with me. Those things should be enough for me to reorient the priorities of my life to go, it's Christ that makes me want to pray. It's not crisis. So what if we, we didn't, weren't waiting for the next problem to occur to make prayer a priority? I think this is one of those things that make a disciple. I mean, even the word discipline, the root of that is the same word that we get disciple from. That we have to create some disciplines in our life. We have to reshape some habits. We have to 
to, to move in the right direction. This is what you see the disciples in the early church doing. It says in Acts 1.14, it says that they all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. This is in Acts chapter 1, and because of this prayer meeting that they had, and they were seeking the Lord, we see in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit was poured out in a very powerful way and changed humanity. From that moment on, they were all together in prayer. Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it talks about this aftermath of like once the dust settled from the excitement of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and they started to get in the rhythm of the everyday, this is what the rhythm of the everyday looked like. In Acts 2, 42, it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. So when the excitement of Sunday went away, when the excitement of the concert or the youth camp or or the conference or whatever, when the excitement of that thing went away, what the disciples of Jesus did is they said, we're going to devote ourselves to some things. We're going to create some habits. The, The Greek word for devoted there means to persist. To persevere, to prioritize, to go, this is a value of how I'm going to live my life. So there's a gap between what we are currently doing and what we want to be doing. And so my challenge to you is this. Let's start by deciding that prayer is a priority. Let's start by going, this is going to be how I grow, how I function. I'm going to draw into God's presence and talk with Him daily. Like, this is going to be how I function. And it's not going to be built off a crisis. It's just going to be built off Christ's relationship with me. So it's got to start with priority because if it doesn't matter, it won't matter. Right? If it, if it doesn't matter... If, if, if I don't really have to, then I don't really have to, right? So here's a, a second thought when it comes to building a lifestyle of prayer. Is that you need to find a place to pray. Now this may be new to you or this may seem common sense, but here's the, here's the reality. you got to find a place for this kind of conversation to happen. It doesn't mean that it only happens in this place, but there needs to be a place where you know that you can go, that you can really build some intimacy with God. So uh, back in, in June, we were able to, to go as a family. Um, my father-in-law had, had gotten a place where we could all gather, and we were able to be on the beach and and thankfully, at this stage in life, all my kids, are, they're getting old. I'm getting old, guys. And uh, Aaron and I would have this evening routine that we would just go walk on the beach every night. We knew no matter what happened during that day, like whether we were going into the town or we were doing something on the beach or whatever the, the routines or the rhythms of that day were, we knew we were going to get some undisturbed time with each other every evening on the beach and so we would go on those walks and those walks they 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 change things in a marriage I, if you're married you you've got to find those places where you can go where you can have those undistracted undisturbed conversations you get to talk about the things that are value. I mean, you get three or four days into those kinds of things, and all of a sudden you find yourself crying over things, speaking words of healing over each other. Like, it just, just powerful things. And it was because we had this place that we could go that, that was that way, right? You've got to have a place in your life, in your in your home, that you go, when I, I want to talk to Jesus throughout my whole day, but I know that that seat, that room, 
that closet, that's my place that I can go and I can be with Jesus. I mean, Jesus had a place. And if Jesus had a place, then maybe we should have a place too, right? It says in Mark 1.35, it says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. When you're thinking about prayer, prayer can happen anywhere. There's times that I, I pray driving down the road. There's times that, and, and the great thing is that we live in a time where there's like Bluetooth communication, so people don't think I'm crazy when they drive by me and I'm talking, right? I can pray driving down the road. I can pray sitting at a table with other people, and they don't even have to know because I can just do it silently, right? I, I can pray in the morning, in the evening. I can pray all kinds of ways, but... It's kind of like my relationship with Erin. I can talk to her all throughout the day, but there's something special about when there's a dedicated time, an undistracted time for that conversation. Jesus found a solitary place. He didn't go to a crowded place. He didn't go to a place where he was going to be distracted. I mean, you even think about it at times, it might have just been him and 12 disciples around a campfire, and he was just going, that's, that's 12 too many. That's 12 too many. All the introverts are like, yep, that's what I'm talking about. Right. I saw, this, I saw this, uh, this meme. It was talking about an introvert's guide to Sunday mornings. And it was like the first six hours of the day is preparing for the meet and greet. Then there's the meet and greet moment. And then the next six hours are just recovering from the meet and greet moment at church, right? But even Jesus, even Jesus is going, the place I've got to get to is a place that's undistracted. So think about that. In your life, where is a place that's most conducive to you having the minimal distractions to be able to have a conversation with your Heavenly Father, to have a conversation with the Lord, to where you can speak and you can also listen? Where is that place? I would say that that place needs to be a place... Where you feel comfortable even praying out loud. That's been a freeing thing for me. To be able to pray out loud. It allows the communication to flow more easily. And for me to be less wondering in my thoughts. I would say it needs to be free from some technology. Maybe you get some worship music involved. But I would say get away from your phone. Right? I've, tried, I've tried reading my Bible and doing a lot of things with my phone. There's too many notifications, and there's too much muscle memory to go to Facebook or Instagram. You know what I'm talking about? Some of you know what I'm talking about. You've got the muscle memory built in. You pick up your phone. You're about to call somebody, and then 15 minutes later, you're like, why am I on Instagram? <laughs> oh, yeah, I was going to call somebody, but you just picked up your phone and boop, boop, boop. You done scrolled. You watched a million reels. You're on YouTube. What? I don't even know what's happening, right? So put your phone away. Get a physical Bible out. If you don't have one, we have free ones in the lobby. Get a physical Bible out. Move all the distractions aside and get along with the Lord. Now for me, I'm a night person. But I had to decide that I wasn't going to let my own like night person thing be the thing that determined when I spent time with Jesus because here's the reality even though I'm a night person I'm a family person and I I, I value those times and those things so I've reoriented my schedule mornings are my time Jesus did it in the morning so I'm like well I kind of want to be like Jesus so so I set that alarm early I'm recently, recently I've decided I was going to cut coffee out of the mornings. Woo! I'm telling you what, coffee helps with your morning time with Jesus. It does. It does. Yeah, like I, I got to get that thing preset the night before. It starts brewing about 10 minutes before I wake up. So when I wake up and I'm like, oh, I don't want to get out of bed, but I can smell it. I'm like, oh, coffee and Jesus calling my name right now. I can do it. I can do it. 
can get down there to my chair. I can get down there to my spot. I can get down there to my place. I, I can do it. If you've never had anybody tell you this before, get a place to pray. Get a place to pray. Get a place to pray. If you, if you need to take a whole room in your house, make that do your room. You need to say, you've heard people say a prayer closet. Take a closet. Turn it in at wherever. Find that place to pray. And third is have a plan for prayer. Have a plan for prayer. Imagine you're going on a date with Jesus, right? If you're going on a date, you don't just, you don't just pick your date up and you just go out and you're like, well, we'll figure something out to talk about. No, you're, you're thinking like, well, we got, I, I got to have some conversation pieces. I got some questions. I got some things I want to know about them. I got some stories I want to tell. Like, I, I remember early on, and it was like, let's don't go to dinner and a movie. Let's go to a movie and a dinner because at, at minimum, we can talk about the movie, right? If I run out of options. But have a plan for prayer. This is what we see in Luke 11. The disciples are observing Jesus praying, and they realize, wait a second, there's a big gap between us and what he's doing. And it says in, in Luke 11, 1 through 2, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, you don't do that like we do it. <laughs> Actually, no, this is what he said. He said, Lord, teach us to pray. Just as John taught his disciples, Jesus said, this is how you should pray. And he goes on and he goes through what we call the Lord's Prayer. This model for how to pray. Every rabbi had these, these models, these sayings, these things. And, and they're going, listen, John's given a kind of a template for his disciples. What, what, how do we approach prayer like you approach prayer? And so he, he gives them, you start with a, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And he's like, okay, this is how we, we got we to gotta start with our focus on God and praising him and acknowledging his holiness and all this kind of stuff. And so they, they realize this template for things. And so one of the things that's helped me going into prayer is to go into time of prayer with more material than I have time for. So I, I, I've got, you know, I want to pray through this scripture. Or I have a prayer model like the Lord's Prayer. And I go, I'm going to go into this and I'm going to pray this prayer model. And maybe I, I'm going to go through and maybe I only get through three of, of all of the different parts of the Lord's Prayer. But I'm going to use that as a guide to help me. I'm going to have a list of all the things that I'm praying for. The, the things that I'm praying for myself, my family, things I'm praying for others. I'm going to show up to that prayer time going, okay, I got, I got 30 minutes. I got two hours worth of stuff. Why do I do that? Because for me, I'm going to get distracted if I only show up with one thing. I'm going to get lost. I, I'm going I'm to wander off and I'm going to find myself on Instagram. Right? But i got to show up with a plan. Show up with a plan. And, and that plan sometimes is I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get quiet before the Lord and I'm going to ask these two questions. And I'm going to just listen. Sometimes that plan is to bring requests. That, that plan can be different, but you need to have a plan. One of the things that we want to give uh, as a resource to all of you guys, in the Motion app, you'll find a bunch of templates for prayer. Uh, and so if you open up the app, you'll see this Pray First Prayer Guide. You open it up, and there's all kinds of different things. The Lord's Prayer, the Tabernacle, personal prayer targets, helping you learn how to pray for the people around you. You can open those up and use those in your prayer time to help build those muscles and uh, to, to be equipped for that prayer season. So what do we do? we we got to make prayer a priority because if we make it a priority, we'll overcome all the obstacles. Right? we got to find a place. got to find a place. You can pray anywhere, but where's that place that you're going to build that intimacy? And show up with a plan. Show up with a plan. Don't stumble into it. If you, if you have no, if you, what is it? If you fail to plan, then you plan to fail. Right, show up with a plan. Show up with a plan. 
And if we do this, not only does it change us, but man, when a church prays, it changes a city. It changes a culture. It shifts the values of a country when believers come together and pray. I want to share this story from the Bible, and then I want us to, to spend some time reflecting and responding to God's Word and, and, and praying together. And there's this story that happens in Acts chapter 12. There's a lot of persecution happening with these early believers. And we see in verse 1, it says that it was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. Listen, all, all these disciples, they were martyred. They were murdered for their faith in Jesus. For this, if the resurrection of Jesus was just a made-up story by the disciples of Jesus, it makes no sense that they would carry that all the way to all of their deaths, one by one. Well, when Herod saw that him killing James was met with approval among the Jews. He thought, well, let me get Peter. Let me get Peter. And so he gets Peter, and then it says that after arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Like, he ain't playing games. He got 16 soldiers guarding Peter. He must have looked like John Cena or something. On a spiritual front. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison. But, but something really amazing happened. It says, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. But the church was earnestly praying to God for him. So Peter's arrested. They know like his ultimate end is he's about to be murdered. He's about to be publicly tried and persecuted. And what do they do? They go, let's get together and let's pray. Let's pray. It seems like this is a situation outside of our control. But let's get together and pray. And they start having this prayer meeting. They're all together in a home. And they're just praying. And they're seeking after the Lord. And they're bringing their requests before Him. And, and they're doing it together. <laughs> Peter's just in jail thinking, Man, there's not a whole lot I can do. But all of a sudden, an angel shows up. Boop. Chains falling off. He, it's so... It's so out of this world that Peter at first just thinks he's dreaming. I mean, he literally just, gates are opening up. He's just like, these guards, he's like, peace, right? 16 times, he's like. He gets out of the prison, gets down the street, and, and then once he gets to the end of the road, it's like all of a sudden he realizes, wait a second. This ain't a dream. I literally just walked out of prison. I literally just walked out of jail. I literally walked away from death. And he goes and he finds the door where all this church is gathered on the other side praying. And he begins to knock on it. It's funny at first, like the girl that goes open the door is like, oh, it's Peter. She shuts the door and just goes back. So, hey, guys, it was Peter at the door. Like, let the brother in. And they're like, what? And then it says this in verse 16. It says, when they opened the door, they saw him, and they were astonished. I want to be a person of great faith. But I know the road to get there is being a person of prayer. Because listen, they were a praying church, no doubt. Their <laughs> prayers were so powerful that it literally set Peter free from a physical prison. And yet when Peter showed up at the door, they're like, what you doing here? 
I thought you was in prison and going to die. So they were a little surprised. They were a little astonished that their prayers actually changed something. So maybe you go, I don't have enough faith for, to believe for all of these things. Start by praying for them. And God will show you along the way. He'll give you those opportunities, the open doors to see that your prayers are changing things. But keep on praying. I wonder what we are grieved about in our society that could be changed through a church that prayed. I wonder what we grieve about for these upcoming generations. That, that they literally were going, oh, they're just... There's so many things being hipped on them. It's like, how is there a hope and a future? I wonder how much of that could be changed through a church that prayed. So we take whatever size faith we have at the moment. And we go, I'm going to be a person that prays. And I'm going to lock arms with people who pray. And I'm going to see that prayer changes everything if we don't do anything else in the next 12 months as a church other than grow and develop in our ability to pray as disciples of Jesus and pray together that's enough to have an impact on the community that we live in we won't stop there but we won't skip back past it either. And so I want you to just start preparing your life, preparing your habits. 21 days of prayer is going to be a time where we all get to kind of level up together and never look back and see what God does in our life. Because what would happen if you daily got in God's presence? What would happen if our church came together and prayed with power and purpose? Things that look like Death Valley would start to bloom. For some of you, maybe you aren't a believer and you don't know Jesus. I want you to understand something so powerful about prayer. It, it, it makes faith more than just believing in who God was 2,000 years ago. It allows you to see who God is today. We can trust in who he was, and we can trust in who he is. And so to all of you who would say, you know, I came in today not really knowing whether I, I believe in God or believe in Jesus. I believe that there's some of you that are feeling that tug inside of your spirit that's drawing you to him. So what if you prayed your first prayer to God and you started a relationship that changed everything? And so if that's you, I just want you to bow, everyone to bow their heads. But if that's you, I want you to pray your, your prayer in this moment for right now. A prayer that changes everything. I'm going to guide you through it. Just pray something like this in your own words. Jesus, I, I come to you right now. Not knowing everything but sensing that you are drawing me to you. And I want a relationship with you. From what I've been told, you died on a cross for my sins 2,000 years ago, and because of that, my sins are forgiven. I'm trusting in that today. I'm believing in that today. I'm leaning my whole life into that truth today that you will forgive me and you will make me whole. And so I received that fresh start, that new beginning. God, not just to go and do life as I was before, but to lean into you. 
I want to know you. Teach me. I want to live for you. Show me. God, I put my life in your hands today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church, just celebrate all the people who prayed that prayer this morning.